All right, so it's 9.01, so I guess we'll get going. I'll do an introduction here. So our speaker today is uh, Yenje Shimansky. He's, um, he's currently at the Leibniz Institute of Plant Genetics and Crop Plant Research, IPK Gattersleben. Um, so he's a, a plant systems biologist uh, investigating the uh, propagation of genetic information from DNA sequence to plant phenotype. And he uses a wide variety of uh, different tools. So graph, from graph theory and machine learning and mathematical mo modeling to integrate uh, multimodal omic and sensor data and to study and understand the molecular mechanisms responsible for the emergence of quality traits in crops. Um, and, and also develops computer games based on uh, real molecular networks for research, fun, and education. So uh, he's been at quite a few different places. So I'll just sort of go down the list of all the uh, his education. Um, so he's he went to uh, the university. I'm sorry if I mispronounced this. The University of Rokla as did a master's um, if in the. 2003 to 2005. And then he worked and did his PhD under the supervision of uh, Dr. L. Willitz, Willmitzer, sorry, um, and uh, in uh, Germany at the Max Planck, Max Planck Institute of Molecular Plant Physiology, and then did a few postdocs uh, at Max Planck and at the University of Tel Aviv um, and at the Weissman Institute, and um, is now, as I said, at the Leibniz Institute of Plant genetics in Germany. Um, so uh, he also has given us some some fun interests. Um, so he's is interested in electronic music, opera, bird watching, sci-fi, and and coding stuff. So that's a pretty good uh, eclectic uh, array of fun fun interests. Um, so I don't want to take up any more of of Yenji's time. So I uh, will turn it over to him and we can get started. Okay, thank you for this introduction. I think the connection, my connection is frozen. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you, but your okay. video your Good. video was frozen, but it looks like it's better now. Okay. Let's hope it's going to be stable. Um, th thank you very much for this introduction and the invitation to this seminar series. Um, today, I would like to talk about um, the wild metabolism of domesticated tomato. Uh, the story is about dissecting the genetic basis of variation in tomato fruit metabolism and pathogen resistance. Um, most of this project uh, has been done uh, during my postdoc um, at the Weizmann Institute of Science in the group of Professor uh, Asaf Aroni. So the story starts with um, 100 years of domestication of tomato that resulted in a myriad of tomato varieties. And during that process, multiple quality traits were gained, resulting in the tomato as we know, know it now. Um, but um, the robustness and resistance traits of the fruit were lost. And one of the best sources of robustness and resistance traits are the wild ancestors of modern cultivars. And uh, most of all of them, as you probably know, come from South America. And a couple of them are actually sequenced and well uh, characterized on the genetic level. And um, a kind of model um, wild species of tomato model for robustness is, um, uh, is the Coprasicum penelli, which is can be described as kind of a wild beast. It's, it's growing in the mountainous 
regions in Peru. It can resist, is, is, is very robust towards adverse environmental conditions um, and is, is sequenced. Um, so it represents a very attractive donor of genes that can encode, can be responsible for robustness traits. And uh, in this project, we looked at, um, we researched the possibility of transferring the resistance traits from Solanum penelli into a uh, modern cultivar of Solanum, modern tomato cultivar, Solanum lucoversicum, uh, while um, keeping the, the original Solanum lycopersicum um, yield uh, quality and, and quantity traits intact. In order to do so, we used um, cross, crosses. Um, and in particular, we looked at introgression lines that have been developed in Danny Zamir's lab. And these introgression lines contain small fragments of Solanum penelli um, genome in the background of the Solanum uh, lycopersicum genome. These small introgressed fragments of Solanum uh, penelli uh, are well characterized on the level of both gene sequence as well as gene annotation. So we are not working only on the level of the introgression, but we can actually look inside the introgression and identify the differences between the genes that would be there in the Solanum lycopersicum background and are now introgressed from Solanum penelli. And whenever we have these differences on the level of gene sequence in these introversion regions, and we observe a particular phenotype emerging in this line, we can make association. Of course, with one line, it's not possible to make reliable associations. However, we had more than 400 lines having the introgressions in very various regions of, of, uh, of the genome. Therefore, we could see um, if for, for each gen genomic region, we could, we could make associations between the occurrence of the introgression in that region and phenotypes, if the phenotypes were observed. Um, so such associations between the, chain, the differences on the genetic level, so between the genome and the effect of um, these differences on the phenotype, um, yeah, we can define it as um, we call it mapping, yeah, association mapping. Um, or in case of such introgression lines population or invert lines, that's um, QTL analysis, so quantitative trait loci identification. Um, and this is using statistic, this basically is um, defining statistical associations between the genet genomic variable and the genetic level and, and, and some par phenotypic parameters. But these associations don't tell us anything about the mechanism, the molecular mechanism of that link. Um, and often it's very difficult to guess this um, mechanism because actually between the genotype and the phenotype, there are multiple level, levels of cellular organization and multiple levels of processing of genetic information and that do not only stepwise process that information but also interact with each other. So for example, the genotype results in specific, so the, the genome is expressed as transcriptome and on the level of this transcriptome we can have more transcripts than one from one gene that these transcripts interact with each other, the products interact with each other and that all is um, the, the interactions on the transcriptomic level 
result in processing of that information on the metabolic level, which is actually even more complex. So only knowing putative paths between from the genotype to the phenome through multiple uh, levels of cellular organization and, and, and the, the whole integrated network, molecular network, we can guess what could be the molecular mechanism of the phenotype, phenotype emergence. And actually in this project, we, we tried to, to, to see if we are able to identify these paths through this, this multi-level uh, uh, network from the gene to the, to, the, to the phenotype. And in order to do so, we needed a lot of data. Huh? And uh, this data we needed on the level of the genotype. This has been given by the genotype population. And, but we had to get transcriptomic data, metabolomic data, and uh, phenomic data. And we acquired this information for two developmental stages of tomato fruit. Um, and using RNA-seq technology for the transcriptome analysis uh, and LCQ of MS uh, analysis, so mass spectrometry-based metabolomics uh, in order to measure the metabolites. On the phenotypic level, the phenotypes, we in total, we uh, collected 17 phenotypes. 16 of them were actually given to us by the Danny Zamir lab. And one of them, we, we scored ourselves performing, uh, yep, scoring that was, it, this, this phenotype was the botrytis similar resistance. I'm going to get to it in, in, in later slides. So how did we, what can we do with this data? Well, each of these data sets represents a, a very specific state of the system and the interactions with, be, between them. If we imagine the network of the interaction between these, these data sets, um, they represent a very specific, specific biological uh, um, relationships, um, theoretically, some of them, of course. Um, so on the level of interactions between, the, between these the, the, the measured variables, we potentially are able to identify the relationships such as um, substrates, intermediates of um, biochemical, re biochemical reactions, regulators or enzymes of biochemical reactions, um, regulators of gene expression, et, et cetera. But how to do it? Well, we tested multiple statistical uh, and machine learning approaches, uh, such as classical linear mixed models. We tested Bayesian approaches, uh, artificial neural networks, and regularized regression models. And um, the best performance uh, was what the what we could uh, identify what we defined as the best performance uh, was the cross-validated prediction power. And the regularized regression models performed best here. And let me explain you what exactly I mean. So our task here was to look if we just take all of this collected data if there is a, if we can have an algorithm that uses this data in order to predict the phenotype and does not only predicts the phenotype, it's not only correlation with that phenotype, but we also achieve a well prediction in the cross-validation test. So it means that we trained an algorithm on the one set of the, uh, of, uh, of the data and then we take this, uh, the subset of the data that has not been used for the training of the algorithm, and we try to predict the phenotype from this test set. And so this is basically cross-validation uh, test, and uh, we achieved quite well prediction 
for the phenotypes. And here I show you the, the, an example of the phenotype that was uh, resistance to a fungal pathogen, uh, where we did not only achieve uh, close to uh, 0.8, so actually a bit, uh, it's 7.95, but close to 0.8 uh, um, prediction uh, accuracy. Um, but also, uh, we identified the features from the features on the genetic level, the features on the transcriptome level, and on the metabolome level that contribute to that prediction. And that means that um, these, these selected features are metabolic, transcriptomic, and genetic candidates that can be further uh, investigated and probably have something to do with each other. Uh, moreover, um, these predictive features, uh, while selecting for these predictive features, we were able to uh, select much less features than the number of samples. And whenever we have uh, less parameters than the number of observations, as you probably know, then we can start to analyze the interactions between the variables. So we did it and we started to describe the contributions of each of the data levels to prediction of the phenotypes. And for example, for botrytis cinerea resistance, uh, what we observed is that transcripts had the highest prediction accuracy, uh, while the genetic level and the metabolo metabolites uh, showed much lower prediction power. In comparison, the combined data set of all of them uh, showed a result not much higher than the transcriptome level. Uh, in so-called exclusion test, where we took the whole data set while excluding one of the, 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 the classes, um, the, um, the result was, was very similar. Exclusion of the transcriptome level decreased the prediction power significantly. So if we talk about in terms of percentage of explained variants, for this particular phenotype, we could see that only 3% of the variance was explained by the genome, but already 33% was explained by the, the transcriptome, and further uh, in total around 10% uh, for both the break and red, uh, uh, red ripe stage of tomato in total was, was, was uh, impacting the, 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 um, the botrytis in our resistance. Um, in order to analyze the interactions between all these predictive variables, we used a network approach where we linked the variables that uh, first of all correlate with each other, and second of all uh, show co-localization of the genetic associations, and third of all are either positively or neg uh, either positively or negatively impact in this case botrytis in our resistance, and building such network allowed us to identify sub networks that um, um, that um, pass our criteria. Uh, these these three these three criteria. The one was find a susceptibility cluster and the susceptibility, uh, susceptibility cluster um, gathers genes and metabolites, so transcripts and metabolites uh, that positively correlate with susceptibility or negatively correlate with, with the resistance and the resistance cluster are those that positively correlate or positively affect the resistance. So of course we were interested in these resistance the resistance cluster. Uh, yeah, here I, I show how we just fish these these two two clusters from the the the, the, the global network 
of of interactions and uh, yeah we were interested how actually what are these genes what are the transcripts uh, and metabolites that um that we identify um we looked at the names of them the, yeah they they didn't tell us much so i decided to to look how the transcripts um behave during ripening and in different uh different tissues so we looked at the gene expression uh of these transcripts in five developmental stages of tomato fruit in mature green mature green breaker orange orange and red in two tissues flesh of the fruit and the skin so these five developmental stages describe the development of the fruit from the immature green to the breaker stage where there is just the the, the fruit is, is green and it increases in biomass to its um, uh, uh, final size. And then in the breaker stage, the ripening starts and the qualitative change of the tomato fruit starts. Um, it becomes, of course, orange and then red, but there's much more happening. Um, and I was surprised or actually happy happily surprised to see that the genes that we identified in completely orthogonal uh, experiment uh, as these genes related to the susceptibility and resistance show uh, a very clear pattern uh, of the gene expression it, of their gene expression in different developmental stages and, and, and tissues. So in both analyzed tissues, the genes that we defined as susceptibility genes or susceptibility, susceptibility transcript show high expression levels in the orange and red stage. So here I mark, mark the susceptibility cluster here on this bar in red. And then the resistance tr transcripts here marked in blue uh, are mostly expressed in the early stages of tomato fruit development. And um, why is it nice? Well, the tomato fruit is actually susceptible in orange and red stage and its resistance it is it is resistant to 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 the fungal pathogens between the immature and the breaker stage um so of course we we were happy about it and we decided to check some of the candidates and we selected we could not check all of them but we selected three uh for the virus induced gene silencing experiments um, we su successfully decreased the expression of these genes using the VIX assay and then performed um, a pathogen uh, uh, resistance assay on, on, on these fruits. And indeed, we saw that the um, downregulation of expression of the resistance genes, of the selected resistance genes, increased the size of the lesions. Uh, significantly increased the size of the lesions um, caused by inoculated um, uh, fungal pathogens, so botrytis cinera. Um, that was nice to see. And uh, another level of data that we networked here are the metabolites. And for example, the three metabolites that were directly annotated were the fluoratine trihexose, um, the glucosylfluoratine and naringenine. And they actually have been, so most of all the fluoratine and glucosylfluoratine were shown to, uh, to act as fungicides in apples. However, we're not, we're, we're not shown before to have any particular function in, in tomato that was Nice to see. And naringenine is known to, uh, 
to have a potential as an antioxidant. So we thought that maybe it's uh, it's uh, yeah, uh, react um, its action is related to the um, harvesting of 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 ROS. Um, but we had also a couple of unidentified metabolites, and uh, these we found most interesting, of course. And one of them we identified as a pantotenic acid, and performed and as and ordered uh, uh, um, standard for pantotenic acid, and looked if low concentrations comparable to those. Uh, observed in, in tomato fruit can affect the growth of botrytis similia. And we checked it on plates and actually it worked uh, uh, in, in, in fairly low, low amounts, in fairly low concentrations, showing the potential of pantotenic as, as um, a natural fungicide. So to summarize the part that is focused on botrytis similia resistance on the pathogen resistance, we were able to uh, identify the um, percentage of the virions explained and by every level of collected data. So the virions that, that, that is of, of Botrytisinia resistance is explained by every level of the data and thus the, every level of, of cellular and system organization. And we could identify gene candidates and candidates, metabolic candidates uh, for endogenous fungicides. So this represents um, kind of untargeted approach uh, for linking the genes with the phenotype and then finding out which transcripts and which elements of the system between the genotype and the phenotype um are responsible for for uh for for this link between the genotype and phenotype um in this case these were um around these were the, the resistance uh, uh transcripts so-called the, the resistance cluster of transcripts and metabolites and, and we could validate that uh, they really uh, they really work but of course we, from this study, we got much more um, than identification of the gene candidates um, in this network approach, because we had many transcripts and many metabolites, and for each of them, we, uh, we could perform um, QTL analysis and identify gene expression QTLs and metabolic QTLs. And here I show, an big overview on all the expression QTLs that we observed. And on this plot, in, in respect to the Botrytis uh, susceptibility score. So you can, on this plot, you can see here in this gray graph, this is, these are the QTLs for Botrytis cinerea susceptibility. So if the susceptibility is low, it means that the plant is resistant. If the, the resistance is the susceptibility is high, that means the plant uh, becomes susceptible. And, uh, and of course, this, these are 12 chromosomes and these associations, so that the, the QTLs are calculated for the genomic regions, yeah, thanks to the genetic mapping. And on this plot, I show just the number of significant expression QTLs for the whole transcriptome data. So it means that, for example, in this on chromosome one, in this region here, we have uh, yeah, something like 65 significant expression QTLs, uh, or here on the chromosome three, we have more than 80. And what we observed, Ah, and while well, here there are positive QTLs, so it means that um, the presence of the introgression in a particular region lead, uh, leads to overexpression of the gene expression. Uh, on, this, uh, on this side, we have the same, but for the genes where 
the presence of the tsunami penelli in progression in this region leads to downregulation of the gene. So the first thing that I saw here, what we, we saw here is that the expression QTL, some of, of the expression QTLs overlap with occurrence of the peaks of either susceptibility or resistance. And the second of all, the occurrence of expression QTLs um, is in hotspots. It's not um, distributed evenly uh, through the chromosomes, but, but appears that there are hotspots of the ex uh, uh, gene expression changes. Uh, and um, some of these hotspots occur in the regions where we know uh, a known regulator, so gene ripening, for example, occur, which is um, which which shows that um, the introgression in the regions of the regulators of the fruit ripening causes uh, bigger changes than in other regions. Of course, some hotspots could not be explained by the the, the presence of particular regulator in in, in the genomic region. Um, yeah, but this is how it is, and this is, I think, um, interesting and can be, can we, we can actually, we should look for the, the, the causes of the occurrence of these hotspots. The third observation here is that many of these hotspots are significantly enriched in particular um, functions, molecular functions, biological processes, um, and uh, we identify it by a simple enrichment analysis. And we could see that among these enriched terms uh, are such as um, stress term, biotic stress, heat stress, um, some photosynthesis related terms, uh, etc. cetera. Um, these functionally coherent hotspots occur both for the positive QTLs and the negative QTLs. Similar uh, observation um, uh, we made for the metabolic QTLs. So here I show similar plot as before, where we have botrytis similar resistance plots here. And here I map the hotspots for the metabolic levels. And uh, here we looked at specialized metabolites mostly. So we used the LCQ of MS. Uh, analysis on the semipolar compounds. It was an untargeted um, analysis. Um, it means that we get masses and their fragmentation patterns, but for most of them, we don't know what exactly these metabolites are, and the annotation we, was done later. Uh, so here I show both the breaker stage and the red ripe stage of uh, uh, of tomato and the levels and the, the result of metabolic QTL analysis um, along the chromosomes. We counted the, the, the number of um, significant metabolic QTLs and plotted them here in this, this um, turkeys or blue uh, for the breaker stage. And, uh, and in yellow for the red ripe stage. So we saw the hotspots here and we were happy to see that actually there are some of these hotspots are expected. For example, we saw immediately a handbook example of Schalkum isomerase one uh, for which the introgression of the Schalkum isomerase one from Salon Penelli to the Salon Nicoparasigum background resulted in a significant downregulation here of um, the many of the flavonoid compounds. So here I show highlighted all of these compounds that some of these of the compounds that form this this large peak here, here with the relative expression comparison to the control. Uh, we see that many of them are downregulation. Here yeah, they're putative. Some of them are, are a known name. Some of them are putative. And why it happens? Well, the, it, it is because of the differential expression of Solanum penelli, Schalkum isomerase one in respect to Solanum mycoparsicum. The Solanum mycoparsicum has uh, several uh, ha has uh, uh, several tata boxes and an, an 
an enhancer in the promoter region. And in comparison, so Penelli has only one tether box, which is actually far away from the from the gene. And while the gene itself, it's 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 almost the same between Slum uh, Penelli and Slum Lycopresicum. It seems that the difference in the promoter region, which functionally is, is very clear, uh, causes uh, differential expression of this that that gene and uh, and the significant metabolic phenotype. This, of course, has been checked on the gene expression level and before. Uh, has been also characterized in another population, in another introgression uh, uh, population by uh, Ballester et al. But they use the introgressions from Milevskia, uh, Solano Milevskia, but with, uh, uh, with a very similar structure of the gene promoter. There are two, so besides the handbook examples, uh, we looked for new interesting candidates and these two of them were uh, associated with changes on the level of steroidal glycol colloids. Here, the, the, these, these, they were actually here, there are these peaks uh, of rather small. However, the, the, the QTLs themselves were actually quite significant. And, uh, in, and in in on chromosome two, we found a, a, a nice QTL for uh, hydroxytomatine, upregulated hydroxytomatine, and um, in the region of that QTL, uh, well, in the region of that QTL, there were twenty nine genes. We found a two oxoglutarate, uh, the two oxoglutarate deoxygenase there. Uh, that is a nice candidate for um, for the biocentric pathway of the hydroxytomatine. And uh, another candidate gene that we found interesting for the steroidal glycol colloids uh, was uh, the QTL of downregulated uh, esculeocyte A. Uh, and that downregulated esculeocyte a um, was associated with uh, the re genomic region of 30 genes, and among them, uh, uh, we fished out a glycosyl transferase that seems to, to be fitting the biosynthetic pathway of the esculeocyte A and um, yeah, could explain the, the change. So, of course, how it exactly looks like. So, the a UDP dependent glycosyl like, so transferase is downstream of the two oxoglutarate deoxygenase. And these are the so yes. um, and uh, these are uncharacterized steps so far of this bi putative biosynthetic pathway. So we decided to check them and perform, we isolated the genes and perform enzymatic assays comparing um, in by heterologous, heterologous expression of these genes, uh, as a, uh, isolation of the proteins and, perform, and uh, performing the, the enzymatic assays on the purified standards of the sub of the, the, the um, enzyme substrates. And we could really, uh, show that the, the two oxo selected two oxoglutarate deoxygenase has the activity of producing hydroxytomatine from alpha tomatine. Um, moreover, while our um, QTL analysis uh, showed uh, um, the increased levels of hydroxytomatine, we predicted that um, the parallel uh, pathway leading to the hydroesculeosite A from the common intermediate from both pathways from the hydrotomatine uh, might use exactly the same enzymes. And uh, that was true. We could also successfully show um, that that two oxoglutarate deoxygenase uh, uh, acts both on alpha tomatine and the hydrotomatine. Um, this the same we could not check for uh, we could not prove for the the this UDP uh, because of uh, the UDP dependent transferase 
um, and the relationship between the levels of hydroxyhydrochromatin and the hydroxyhydrochromatin. Uh, we, however, the, the, the glucosal transferase uh, um, function has been shown for um, producing the escudosite A from acetoxyhydroxytomatin, which is its um, uh, direct precursor. So we characterize two genes, uh, two, two um, metabolic genes, uh, and we call them GAME31 and GAME5. Uh, we call them game uh, um, from cacozo alkaloids metabolism, yeah? and all of the of the genes involved in uh, uh, bi biosynthesis and regulation of steroidal steroidal alkaloids are called games. Um, similar pathway um, is actually in potato, and we. Um, Decided since we and and uh, since we had new enzymes characterized for tomato, we decided to look for the homologs and perhaps characterize the pathway of the leptins biosynthesis, uh, uh, which requires very similar reactions, very similar steps. Um, but of course, on different substrates. So we looked at, we searched for GAME31, and we predicted that the, the homolog to GAME31 should act at shaconine, uh, alpha shaconine and alpha solanine, leading to production of leptin 1 and leptin 2, respectively. But we actually did not find game 31 instead we found that in the same genomic region where uh, um, the game 31 when the closest homolog of tomato game 31 in potato occurs there is yet another gene game 32 that actually has this function and that was found by my colleague um, in another project uh, that we worked on together uh, and published in in, in, in in separate paper. But um, why actually this is important? Well, the biosynthetic pathway of the leptins is important because the leptins are known to be um, uh, to to uh, uh, be responsible for the resistance to a very uh, uh, common pest of potato, uh, which is uh, Colorado, Colorado uh, potato beetle. And uh, I found even, I found even uh, uh, a, a shocking uh, information from the 1950s from the communist Poland, where um, they uh, described that um, um, the American planes were uh, in breach of established flight zone, dropped a huge amount of Colorado be uh, potato beetle uh, in the Eastern Bloc uh, because, well, at that time we had a big, there was a big plague, plague of, uh, of that pest. And uh, yeah, it, it seems that it was easy to, to, to blame American imperialists for that. It's quite funny. But now we can, we, 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 ha we potentially know how to. Um, produce leptins in tomato and um, uh, we can resist more drops of Colorado potato beetle in the fields. Good, so uh, I showed you that uh, the integra integration of multiple data can be used in two different approaches. One kind of non-targeted that we can look for the associations between the variables, use network approach to find the clusters of correlated transcripts and metabolites and phenotypes and and uh, define them as functional units for linking the genes with uh, with the phenotype and that was the, the example of um, 
uh, protracted zero hour resistance. And I show you that more classical approach where we uh, perform QTL analysis. We look at the regions where the QTLs for the, the particular metabolites or transcripts on phenotypes occur. We find the candidates and we characterize them. Both approaches work quite well. Uh, and yeah, and uh, everything what we what we identified is within basically this this this, this network of putative interactions. This data resource, of course, can be used much beyond our few examples that we managed to characterize. And therefore, we have um, generated so-called Kill Build browser. So it comes from the introgression lines and backwards introgression lines multi-omic browser where we uh, put, we have put all our data and programmed this simple shiny app to browse it, to look for your favorite gene, to look for your favorite metabolite, favorite transcript, find other transcripts, other metabolites that colocalize with it in terms of uh, uh, genetic um, associations. Um, yeah, find default changes, change the thresholds of significant, et cetera, et cetera. So the link to the browser I will uh, will be in the description of the video, as well as link to all the links to all the papers. Um, yeah, so uh, all that was done, um, uh, all the experimental work and the big part of the of the data analysis was done uh, in the in the lab of Asaf Faroni. Uh, and uh, some of the, the, the work has been continued in IPK by me and mostly the data analysis. Um, Danny Zamir was uh, heavily involved in provides, providing the, the plant material and expertise. Uh, yeah, and we consulted uh, uh, the result with many other people. Uh, I, want to do at the end some small shameless self-promotion because just after finishing the project i was offered a, a, a position a pi position at the ipk gottesleben uh, where i um, formed a network analysis and modeling group and uh, it's a very nice campus in the middle of uh, uh, of germany next to Harz mountains it's quite a picturesque uh, landscape there uh, and I'm super happy to work with uh, many talented students. And what we do is uh, we do very similar things, but on the cere cereal crops, because IPK is all about cereal crops, small grain crops, barley, wheat, rye. Uh, currently, we perform a very similar experiments on barley, where we integrate uh, gene expression data, metabolomic data, uh, phenotypic parameters, and hyperspectral drone imaging um, in a fairly similar setup on the uh, a multi parental nested population of, of barley. Uh, yeah, and our goal is to again uh, link the plant genotype with the quality traits of, or, uh, of barley while taking uh, into account the spectral properties of the plant, specialized metabolism and fertilization and nutrient use in terms of metabolism. And another project that we, uh, uh, that we follow is doing, making computer games. And uh, <clears throat> currently we develop uh, something that we call plant ed game, which is a scientific game about being a plant. And what actually plant as game does is it use metabolic modeling. So it's a, it's a full plant metabolic model that is able to turn the environmental parameters such as light intensity, availability of nutrients um, uh, and presence of specific stresses into capability of the metabolic network to produce specific metabolites and thus specific biomass. And that biomass might be just uh, just biomass of the plant tissue, but this biomass can be also mod modified to produce defense compounds. Uh, and the player has an option to um, to decide about which 
organ to grow, um, how to modify the metabolism, how to modify the, 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 the composition of the biomass in order to interact, in order to grow the plant and interact with the changing environment. So that's um, yeah, our pet project now. And uh, I, I'm trying to popularize it because it, it seems that it's gonna be awesome uh, and might have perhaps more users than just educational. Yeah, here are some screenshots from different developmental st uh, stages, the different stages of the, of the game development. Here you have an example where, for example, the plant uh, is exposed to some rain. Um, and uh, when you look on this uh, UI here, you can see the, the ways how we can interact with the plant metabolism by, for example, investing different uh, amount of resources, either to putting it to storage or to growing root, stem or leaves. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm open for discussion and questions. Awesome. Thanks. That was uh, that was super, super cool. Um, yeah, so if you have questions, just either type them in the, the chat box or uh, let us know you want to turn your mic on and you can ask the question yourself. We have a question from Federico. Go ahead, Federico. Oh, uh, yeah, hi, how are you? Sorry, I just got a phone call. <laughs> I got distracted. But yeah, thanks, very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, it's kind of a strange question, but so here you, uh, you address interspecific variation uh, for traits, yeah? Like these integration lines are usually between two species, although I guess you can also do things like magic lines where you cross more species. But I was wondering if there are kind of new statistical or experimental frameworks to study more interspecific variation, but without having to do crosses, like the variation that you have maybe within a group of closely related species or something like that. Have there been advances? Mapping? Yeah. I guess you, if, it will be something like a GWAS, but across species rather than mm -hmm. within a population. Have there been advances mm -hmm. on that field or? Um, okay, so. You break some of the, the assumptions, of course. Of species. The GWAS, <laughs> I think, yeah. I think you can still do GWAS, including the wild species, uh, mixing them with, with the cultivars. But I'm not sure how, um, how much informative it would be by going further and further away from, 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 well, yeah. I mean, the assumption of the GWAS is that you have a limited amount of variation that explain what you what, what you see, and then once you 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 really compare species that are far away from each other, um, this of course, yeah, as you said, breaks the assumptions of the GWAS. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but then maybe yeah, you can use the phylogeny to kind of correct for that or something like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not aware uh, so of uh, uh, of the advances in in this particular field. I I, I, I did not actually. I I, I did not. Okay, think thank you. I mean, we have so. Yeah, but but it's a very interesting interesting point. Uh, yeah, because actually it, sometimes yeah. you don't find the the metabolites that you want in a species that you can Absolutely. actually cross with other or and. And then you still want to sample all of these species and, and, and for genus like Solan, which are so diverse, you have so much diversity and, and you don't want to focus Absolutely. just two species or, or the potato clade or the tomato clade only, but maybe go beyond that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, 
what you actually when it, if we are talking about metabolism so um there the well this this is a big big thing there in uh in the field of um uh genome scale metabolic modeling where you have a certain set of metabolites that you want to be able to synthesize by the model but on one side so you have products of the model and you know that the plant is able to produce them and on the other side you have a set of genes that um so the toolkit right so this is what, what you start with and they try to re reconstruct a metabolic model that links both things so basically the 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 composition, metabolic composition, the biomass, and 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 the, the biosynthetic capacity, and what is done there is that we actually look at multiple species, as many species as possible, and um, and take the information from one species of our interest, make a um, um, kind of rough reconstruction. And then fill the gaps because we you usually don't have the links uh, using the toolkit from 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 uh, from from a single species, the enzymatic toolkit from single species because not all the enzymes are uh, uh, identified. And then so you have gaps. You you know theoretically from the biochemistry what should be there, but you don't have the enzyme doing it. So you then you search through all other species, and this is kind of what you uh, uh, what. I guess what you were talking about, because you need to integrate information from as many species as possible in order to be able to fill the gap and find the, the most likely candidate. And so this has nothing to do with uh, uh, qualitative genetics here, but the concept is that you really use uh, genetic information from, from, from many different related species. Yeah, for the particular purpose. Yeah. Um, but if you so have the, something like a transcriptome too, like the metabolome and the transcriptome, could you just input that in two in there so, so you also know the enzymes that are expressed? And, uh, and then you, would that yeah. help you reconstruct things? Yeah, sure. Uh, so so one, one thing, so okay, the, these are two different. So usually the, the the model of reconstruction is on the level not on the level of gene expression because you have different genes expressed in different conditions it's really hard to to make a model like tissue specific model for example um but so we we do it on the level of of, of the genetic information and the presence of the gene in the in the genome but we we don't have to look at the actual gene expression as transcriptome, but transcriptome as assembly. Um, you, we can look at the, the, the transcriptome uh, assemblies, and there is, for example, this 10,000 transcriptomes project as, uh, as a very nice example that might be really a fantastic resource to, to explore the possible um, yeah, relationship of occurrence of, 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 of yeah, specific functional transcripts as enzymes in different species. No. Cool. Well, thank you very much. I know, I know, I answered this question a bit around, but uh, no, but <laughs> it's, it's the most specific question that I have gotten to okay. the most specific answer that I have gotten so far. So, thank you very much. Awesome. So uh, we've got a couple, couple more questions. Two from Stacy uh, asked me to read them. So the first one mm -hmm. is. Um, does the does the anti beetle compound have an effect on humans? So I mm. I guess is there any toxicity or other effects in humans? Do you know? I don't know. <laughs> Not that easy to test, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, cool. Um, embarrassing it's, it, it's known uh, it's embarrassing for me it's known for sure by the biochemists and to any biologists but yeah I'm, I'm, as a, I'm an ignorant computational biologist no no worries yeah it would be interesting to know like how the the specificity of of what it's acting on if it if it varies across different different groups of organisms or something um well the the these are probably anti-nutritional compounds, so so they might yeah they might some uh, effect. The question is is if they still have it after boiling, um, and also what what the beetles eat is not necessarily always what we eat. Yeah. Yeah. 
Cool. Mm -hmm. So the second question from Stacy is, uh, uh, I know that there are often trade-offs between metabolites or even entire classes of them because of shared precursors. So is that apparent mm. from your work? So I get, you know, competition between different branches where things share precursors. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, um, we didn't look specifically at these uh, um, uh, trade-offs. I mean, what you see is uh, many the negative the, the negative correlations between between occurrence of of uh, of the metabolites will show these trade-offs, and probably it's something to look uh, something to to look at. Um, yeah, uh, we should probably look at it. The problem is that we had so much data uh, coming out of this experiment that, um, yeah, it was more um, picking the low hanging fruits from here um, than, looking at, um, than looking at the data from all possible angles. Yeah, but you're definitely right. Uh, right. Perhaps we, we can find some new interesting trade-offs here. Cool. Um, all right, so there's one, another question on here from Josna. One, do you, do you want to ask this or do you want me to read it? I guess I can, I can read it. So one basic question, how easy was it to get the cross between uh, S. Pinelli and S. Lycopersicum? Oh, I, again, I have no idea. I didn't do it. The, um, the, the population uh, has been uh, developed in Danny Zamir's lab, and the original population is Ashet at all 1995. So the first lines of it have, have been developed, and um, it took some time to get um, yeah more than 400 introgression lines right now. So I guess it's yeah. Um, well, I, I can't say anything about the cross itself, but I guess the most uh, problematic is uh, or time consuming is the mapping of this the genetic mapping. Cool. Um, yeah, so I don't know, again. But probably not super, super easy, sounds like if it took a lot, quite a while. Um, all right. Um, so I don't know, is any, any other, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. If not, you can say Thanks again to NJ. That was a cool talk. And uh, yeah, we appreciate you joining us for the seminar. You're welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation. Sure thing. All right. Um, I guess we'll see, you, see everybody who shows up next time. Yeah, and uh, next Friday, uh, the speaker is Jaime Sibaqueda, and he's going to be talking about novel effectors identified from the genomic resources of Fusarium oxyporum, forma species physali, a pathogen of Cape Gooseberry, physalis peruviana plants. So see you next week. Bye.